So today I thought we would look at a great popular classic and it is Band on the Run by Wings. We're celebrating 50 years of Band on the Run. This album was released at the end of November uh, in 1973 in the UK, came out in the US I think a week later on December the 5th. It's the first Paul McCartney album I ever heard and uh, I became obsessed with it, you know. Um, I used to pour over the poster um, for hours on end, this great uh, poster that was put together by Linda McCartney featuring Polaroid photographs that she took of the sessions in Lagos. I think it was it was the music and it was the packaging together which made this record so beguiling, I suppose, to a to a child of I would have been seven. The picture, a masterstroke really. It was it was a great hypnosis design shot by Clive Arrow Smith and um, it's just so iconic. It's one of the great visual representations of pop and rock music in the 1970s. We've got some i uh, got some great famous people on the cover here. We've got Michael Parkinson here, who was a, a chat show host in the UK. We've got Clement Freud, the British politician, who's, whose career ended in uh, in disgrace much later on, etc, etc. Christopher Lee, um, and of course the three members of Wings, Paul Linder and Denny Lane. And um, and on the back cover, in a great uh, great touch, classic hypnosis style, you've got the, uh, the photographs done as a kind of um, FBI wanted style selection of photographs on a desk. And you can see here the picture of the memorandum there explaining how, how these three wanted criminals, you know, you know were last seen in, uh, in Lagos. It's great fun. The picture on the inside cover was also very iconic, a photograph of Paul, Linda and Denny uh, in the company of some African children and uh, lyrics on the back. This is actually an Indian copy of the record that was given to me by um, John Heaton and um, it's quite unusual because it features not the Band on the Run label everybody knows but it's actually on the Green Apple label so that's quite interesting. Uh, the original record uh, as you will know, came with the three mug shots on the cover. Again, a really nice, uh, a really nice design idea. And I've always loved the typography on this record too. Just the, just the lettering of the band on the run title. It just looks really elegant, really classy. There was something about this album, I think, that was classy. I think that was what McCartney had been searching for, maybe in his first few solo albums, as you can see at the back there, starting from the McCartney album in 1970, going on through. Uh, Ram and then moving on to the first Wings album which was Wildlife and then Red Rose Speedway. All those records have a lot to commend them but there was a sense I think in the early 70s that Paul was feeling his way, maybe he'd lost his way a little bit, obviously the dissolution of the Beatles had been a, a great personal disaster for him and he was trying to piece things back together. Famously what happened at the end of um, the first incarnation of Wings, so this was all taking place in the summer of 1973, the first version of Wings fell apart. Henry McCulloch, the guitarist, stormed out of the barn one day on the Scottish farm, fed up with being told how to play a particular solo. The trip to Lagos had already been planned. McCartney had seen uh, a film. It was um, Ginger Baker in Africa, which was a, which was a documentary about the uh, the ex Cream drummer who at the time was living in Africa. Uh, he'd seen that on the BBC and he got it into his head that Lagos would be a great destination to go to to record an album. Originally he was going to, well he was considering Rio, Rio de Janeiro and then Lagos came up. He found out that EMI had a studio based out in Lagos and then he was just totally on the, sold on the idea of going there. The rest of the band I don't think were too keen on the idea but when Henry McCulloch left the band uh, I think there was some talk within the group, you know, Denny Lane certainly wanted McCartney to get a guitarist in, you know, as a replacement before they went out to Lagos. There was even some talk of Jimmy McCullough, who would later go on to be Wings' guitarist. He was in the picture frame just for a split second to go out there, not sure how that came about. But Paul um, wasn't to be delayed, even when Denny Sywell then quit the band just on the eve of flying out to Lagos. In fact, I think legend has it that the car came to pick Denny up from his London house to take him to the airport and it was at that point that Denny decided to bail out and he, he phoned McCartney and told him that he wouldn't be coming and um, I think at that point Paul decided he was just going to go hell for leather. He was going to go to Lagos with Linda, with Denny and record the album in record time. This record, um, well I'll just run you through some of the chronology here. So they flew to Lagos, the, well the McCartneys flew to Lagos on uh, on 
uh, August the 30th, 1973, Denny Lane had flown out the, the day before with the um, with the engineer Jeff Emmerich, who of course had worked with the Beatles. I think taking Jeff Emmerich along um, was maybe subconsciously at least an attempt by Paul to perhaps... Uh, you know, recapture some of that Beatles magic. Jeff and Lane flew to Lagos um, on August the 29th, and McCartney's followed on Oct uh, on August the 30th. And by the time we get to September the 22nd, they're flying home back to London again. So it was a real quick fire set of recording sessions. If you compare it to the recording sessions for, say, for example, Ram which stretched out for months and months with all kinds of different studios being used, different engineers, different producers, well, different engineers, different musicians. And, um, you know, that was an album where McCartney was maybe trying to second guess himself, going round and round the houses. You know, famously, he'd done 88 takes, I think it was, of High, 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 you know, just trying to get it right with that first incarnation of Wings. But I think going out to Lagos with just himself and Denny on guitar and vocals, Linda on vocals and keyboards, it brought a sense of focus to the recording sessions and um, there was not going to be any messing about really. McCartney played drums, there was some talk of him using Ginger Baker originally but he didn't really want to have Ginger on the tracks because Ginger was, I think Ginger was too accomplished, too busy were the words that Paul used. He wanted to use his own technically limited approach on the drums, uh, which was, you know, he didn't have too many chops or t uh, or too much technique, but he had a certain style all to his own, which really came through on the tracks. Talking of Ginger Baker, there was a bit of a misunderstanding when, when the members of Wings flew out to Lagos. I think Ginger thought that they were going to use his um, ARC studios, and when he found out that they were using the EMI Lagos studios, he wasn't too happy. And then, and then, but of course, uh, the, the the Lagos studio, uh, the EMI studio in Lagos, was in a right old state when the McCartneys arrived there. The place was primitive. Um, the microphones were mediocre. Um, there was a very limited, technically limited tape deck where it wasn't possible to do multi-track recording in the way that artists by this point were used to doing. There were certain technical limitations there. Uh, there were no separation booths for the musicians to play in, so McCartney had to ask the carpenters in the factory to build him some, so they were trying to record the record uh, while these booths were being built. So all kinds of funky stuff going on. Jeff Emmerich was assigned two African assistants to help him with the recording. Their names were Monday and Innocent, apparently. Uh, Jeff wasn't very happy. Uh, on his first couple of nights there when Denny Lane, I think he had to share a flat, he had to share an apartment with Denny Lane and Denny put a load of dead spiders in his bed and, you know, playing pranks, that kind of thing. I don't think Jeff was too enamoured with his uh, his surroundings. Lagos, of course, quite an impoverished place at the time, lots of crime. It wasn't really the idyllic place that the McCartneys had expected to find. I think the McCartneys had got a certain image, a certain you know, romantic image of Africa as being a particular thing. And uh, when they got there, they found uh, that, the, that the reality was somewhat different. Um, it was kind of coming to the end of the monsoon season, end of August, going into September. So uh, McCartney famously later said, you know, there was red mud falling from the sky. And um, this was really only the beginning of the band's problems. They had all kinds of problems while they were there. The history behind this record is endlessly fascinating. And um, one of the reasons I think that it's gained a reputation is that uh, there's a kind of theory that McCartney works best under pressure. And there was certainly a huge amount of pressure in the studio and uh, in the surrounding area at the time. Just a, quick, just a quick rundown of some of the things that happened. Um, the McCartneys were mugged one evening and had the tapes, the demo tapes, stolen of the original demos that they'd done uh, on the farm in Scotland. So the five-piece version of Wings had actually demoed this album, or at least parts of it anyway, and uh, those tapes were stolen. Uh, the McCartneys you know, came close to being knifed to death. Uh, there were some problems with the um, famous uh, African pioneer musician fellow Ransom Cutie who had got it into his head that the McCartneys were in Lagos to steal their music essentially and um, they paid a rather intimidating visit to the studios one afternoon bringing all uh, fellow Cutie's henchmen down to the studio and demand demanding to listen to the tracks that the band had been recording 
and um, McCartney went out to fellow QT's shrine nightclub one night to hear the band playing and even there there was some close encounters where uh, the McCartney's were given a bit of a frosty welcome and uh, that was quite intimidating. McCartney also smoked some very very strong um, African <laughs> marijuana that evening uh, at the shrine and the next day um, he collapsed in the studio with a suspected uh, collapsed lung and um, had to be rushed to hospital. All kinds of all kinds of mad things going on in addition to all the technical limitations of course that were happening uh, in the studio. But out of that just came this just this great cohesive piece of work probably McCartney's defining statement as a solo artist. I do think it's his most complete work. I know that nowadays Ram is often elevated to McCartney's finest achievement. Um, I don't agree with that. I think Band on the Run has um, a more consistent kind of sound, a more cohesive sound. And the songs, I think, are just top-notch. The album gets off to a great start with the title track, Band on the Run. Fascinating to learn quite recently that originally the two opening segments of that song were originally um, placed the other way around. So the song, as it was originally written, started with the um, If We Ever Get Out Of Here segment, the kind of bluesy, rocky section, and then went into the softer ballad section, the um, Stuck Inside These Four Walls section, and uh, McCartney ended up uh, swapping them round. I thought it was quite interesting. It's difficult to imagine the song being done that way round, but um, this was McCartney thinking in his usual way, you know, thinking symphonically, linking back to the, you know, to his Abbey Road approach, really, trying to weave weave songs together. And that song is a great example of him, um, I think, writing thematically, you know, using the music and the, and the lyrics to depict just this idea of breakout, sailing off into the sun, just that marvellous moment where it breaks out from the prison sequence, you know, into the, into the Sailor Sam. You know, in, you know, into the main part of the song with a wonderful or orchestration and uh, just a great, just a great band performance. You know, one of the best, one of the best things that Wings ever committed to tape, really, probably. And then straight from there into Jet, which is another song of liberation, really, done in a, a slightly different way, more of a surreal way, but it's done in this very kind of highly charged, um, just a classic early 1970s, not glam rock style exactly but um, it's a period piece in a good way it has a certain kind of energy to it a certain classic rock kind of energy great uh, keyboard lines from Linda and a really really infectious chorus and uh, interesting lyrics too I think there's more going on to these lyrics uh, than maybe people give them credit for I think there is a certain um, there's a certain angle to the to the words I know there's some Biographical stuff in there about Linda Eastman's family, uh, you know, the line about the Sergeant Major, all kinds of little interesting lyrical touchstones going on. Great track. Then we've got Blue Bird, which is a beautiful, soft um, ballad, which was one of the songs that was not actually recorded in Lagos. The band had flown back to London when Blue Bird was recorded. It was done uh, at Air Studios in October 73. And ironically, Blue Bird was the only song on the album, really, to feature um, an African musician. Uh, it was a guy called Remy Kabako, who was uh, in the group Third World. Denny Lane had known him because he'd done some work with him. Um, I think it was in Ginger Baker's Air Force. And um, so he came along and he played Styx, Guiro and Conga on Bluebird. And just, just gave it a really evocative sound. Then on to Mrs Vanderbilt, which um, has a couple of interesting lyrical... Um, inspirations. There was a book uh, by Mrs. Vanderbilt. She was a um, etiquette expert. It was a, a kind of manual written maybe maybe in the 19th century or in the early 20th century and the book had belonged to Linda McCartney or Linda Eastman as she was then. I think it was in her family. So that's where the name Mrs. Vanderbilt came from. But then Paul lifted the lyrics to that song, at least part of them, from a British musical entertainer called Charlie Chester, whose song um, Tarzan of the Tape uh, began with the lines, Down in the jungle, living in a tent, better than a prefab, no rent. And of course McCartney turned that into Down in the jungle, living in a tent, you don't pay money and you don't pay rent. And... Um, this is a great song. This is a song which I think is another one which shows McCartney really getting a handle on 
his personal situation at the time. You know, there's great refrains. What's the use of worrying? What's the use of hurrying? I think really starting to feel like he was starting to escape from all the misery and all the angst which had surrounded what had been happening with the, you know, the, with the dissolution of the Beatles in the first part of the 1970s, which was still going on, of course. That was still very much happening behind the scenes. But I think, a bit like Band on the Run, I think Mrs. Vanderbilt is a song of freedom or making a bid for freedom. And it just has that great kind of African chain gang style, ho, hey, ho, chorus, which was so infectious. And it had it had a definite sense of the Beatles about it, I think. Let Me Roll It at the end of side one uh, has always been seen as a bit of a tribute to the Plastic Ono band kind of sound with those reverby guitars. Um, I think the lyric, in my opinion, is a song to Linda, really one of those great songs that he wrote, trying to express his love for Linda, singing, um, I can't tell you how I feel, my heart is like a wheel, let me roll it to you. I think that's, um, I think that's one of Paul's greatest lyrics in a way, just that sense of not really knowing how to express how he feels, this kind of sense of gratitude to Linda. And um, musically, the song was brilliant with those incredibly incisive guitar uh, riffs played by Paul and um, just a great great atmospheric production and uh, it's a fantastic way to close side one. Side two opens with Mamunia, um, the title of which was borrowed from a hotel which the uh, Wings had stayed in um, I think the previous year in um, Morocco in North Africa and this song is wonderful as well this song um, this song is very very nostalgic for me for many reasons but uh, it just has a wonderful kind of homespun charm to it great keyboard playing by Linda particularly in the in, uh, in the closing section where she plays that wonderful Moog line that kind of swoops up into the into the stratosphere it's a real hair-raising moment the song is very simple lyrically um, and you know really it's it's a kind of environmental song really all about rain and how important it is and um, you know he exhorts the listener to strip off your plastic max magical stuff really and um, it's a song which is always a favorite of mine I love the section towards the end where you can hear him shouting in the background you can hear Paul shouting in the background um, everywhere I look it's the same old sound I like it and then he gives this big whoop as the keyboard starts to lift and you really get the sense at the end of that song I think that the McCartneys are just having a great time uh, even though they were having a bit of a hairy time with everything that was happening, I think um, I think there's a sense, at least in the studio, that it's Paul, Linda, and Denny are uh, they've found their groove. They've found a way of playing together. They don't need anybody else. They, you know, they don't need Henry. They don't need Denny Sywell. They're kind of locking together and they're making something really special. Then we got No Words, which is a Denny Lane track written with some help from Paul. I think Paul writes a segment uh, of the song, and this is—I think this is a really nice moment. I know some people don't like it. Uh, some people don't think it belongs on the record. Um, I disagree. I think it's a magical little song, really, with some fantastic vocal harmonies, great little guitar solo. My only criticism of the song is that it fades out too soon. It kind of—it goes into this really hot guitar solo at the end, and then just fades out and you kind of wish wish it had uh, hung around a bit longer but I think it's uh, just a really nice moment on the album Picasso's last words drink to me famously um, came to Paul during a, um, a meal that he was having with Dustin Hoffman and his wife and Dustin said to him you know can you write a song about anything and Paul said yeah I guess so so um, Dustin passed him a copy of a newspaper that had a little article in it about the death of um, Picasso and uh, the, I think he, it was his last words, wasn't it? Picasso's last words, which is what the song um, is called, of course. Drink to me, drink to my health, you know I can't drink anymore. And Paul just started to play this tune just completely spontaneously. And Dustin, was, Dustin Hoffman was yelling at his wife, come quickly, he's doing it, he's doing it. Just a great story. Just, you know, just imagine being there that night. So fantastic. This was another song that was not recorded in Lagos. This was another one. Oh no, this was recorded in Lagos, but not at the EMI studio. It was done at um, it was done at Ginger Baker's Ark Studio with Ginger Baker playing shakers on it, gravel shakers, I think they were. And it was Paul's idea to do this one as a kind of um, musically, maybe or stylistically, as a bit of a tip of the hat to Picasso and the Cubist movement, a kind of collage approach. 
it has lots of different um, interludes and phases to the song and uh, a real sense of Paul having fun I think again it definitely has a very Beatlesy kind of quality to it I think it's a song which is underrated really I think you know if it had been on side two of Abbey Road it would rightly be viewed as a masterpiece but um, I do think on Band on the Run it often gets a bit of short thrift and I'm not entirely sure why because I just think it's a masterpiece and then the song ends with Lept, uh, with um, 1985 at the end, originally called Piano Thing, as the demo that Paul had done. This one was recorded in uh, London after the band flew home. It was 1985, Bluebird and Jet, all three of those were recorded in London. And of course 1985 just is this very atmospheric, pounding piano piece that builds into this incredible orchestrated climax at the end and uh, just those wonderful interludes you know with the huge um, almost like a kind of church organ and um, it builds into a really apocalyptic ending I think which is I think possibly one of the most impressive things that McCartney ever did helped along by wonderful string arrangements by Tony Visconti um, and then it um, ends with the reprise of Band on the Run at the end I didn't mention, of course, in Picasso's Last Words, uh, that song contains really magical little um, recaps of, of Jet and Mrs. Vanderbilt, a sense of, of you know, referring back to songs that had already been on the album. It always made me think of a, almost like a Chinese puzzle box, you know, where you're kind of going into different layers and opening up little secret hatchways and discovering new little secret compartments of the album. Definitely quite magical, you know. I think the record... Um, is not is not a concept album as such, but I think because of the cover and because of how it was um, later interpreted as McCartney's breakthrough album, breakaway album, and because it has all these little kind of magical little uh, reprises and interludes, there is a kind of sense, I think, that it is sort of a concept album. It's one which is definitely very cohesive and um, just has a certain atmosphere to it. That's the best way I can describe it. Perhaps the best feedback that McCartney got from this uh, album was from John Lennon who described it as a great album he also perceptively made the comment that this is Paul McCartney music I think that's what he said it's you know it's it's McCartney music yes it's called Wings but really it kind of doesn't matter who's playing with Paul this is this is a McCartney album through and through not sure if I entirely agree with that I think one of the things that makes this record special is the combination of, of Paul, Linda and Denny just the way they're they're their vocal harmonies weave together and um, I think Linda, I think Paul and Denny particularly reach a high water mark with this record. They were going to do something similar again I think on London Town but with more mixed results I think this was definitely the pinnacle of their partnership. A great album, a huge hit album, without this album it's questionable I think that Wings would have um, got quite onto the trajectory that they ended up on a couple of years after this. They were obviously they were, you know, one of the biggest bands in the world selling out Madison Square Garden and uh, you know huge huge profile so an immensely important album can't quite believe it's 50 years old but there you go we are we are getting older by the day as is the music that we love okay hope you enjoyed the video and i'll be back soon for another one take care bye for now